ensure that they are aware of the position that they're putting themselves in. Um, not because there's you know anything necessarily wrong with saying, I don't like what's going on, let me try to do something about it, but because there are consequences to actions and um it's there are wiser there are wiser steps to take to make sure that the the um a movement in itself is not jeopardized or threatened um when it can be avoided. Um so without further ado, I will uh begin on surveillance, history, tech, and legislation. So the first instance of, of surveillance um in the US what, or one of the earliest at least was the Black Chamber. Um, it was uh, an organization established after World War One. It was basically put together to monitor and take um, cable and telegram communications between anyone that might have been a uh, or been associated with a World War One enemy. Um, and so, what happened was you had the Black Chamber kind of conspiring with different cable companies to intercept their communications. Um, and the funny thing is that there wasn't really any kind of, you know, resistance to it. Um, Western Union, Postal Telegraph, and, you know, the other corporate collaborators kind of just willingly and graciously were like, hey, you know, we, we see you need this for the good of the country, we're going to give it to you. We're going to give you these, our customers' communications and, um, and uh, private uh, conversations. So here you are. And um, this is a uh, Herbert O. Yardley, and he was out of the Black Cipher and the Black Chamber. Um, and it, it got to the point where he actually started just bribing the company and paying them an untraceable cash um, in order to kind of keep them on a kind of payroll. Um, and then I'm sure many of you are familiar with CoIntel Pro. I would like to give a really brief shout out to a uh, fellow board member, Maggie. She kind of reminded me of their existence. Um, and um, Coincel Pro was the FBI's counterintelligence program that was designed to disrupt and neutralize any kind of movement that might be a threat to domestic security, um, even nonviolent groups, individuals, and movements, and it really makes one kind of wonder, how can a nonviolent group be a threat to domestic security? Um, and it's funny, the, the FBI resorted through Coincel Pro to counterintelligence tactics um, because its officials believe that the law could not control the activities of certain dis dis dissident groups. Um, so here we're, we're, we're seeing this was around the um, the 60s and 70s uh, are some of the characters I'm going to be discussing here that they surveilled. Um, they couldn't find any, it sounds like if you, if you have to operate outside of the law, there might be something that you're doing wrong, especially if you are in a position of power. Um, and so some of the groups that were targeted were the Black Panthers, the Socialist Workers Party, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and other civil rights activists, the New Left program, which was composed of several different um, leftist movements, groups, and ideological conglomerates, and even the Ku Klux Klan were um, on their lists of people and institutions that were targeted. Um, so it, 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 it wasn't necessarily one or the other type of ideology that was targeted, which is odd. It's just that anyone that seemed to be in seemed to have some kind of alternative thinking to you know the status quo um in a sense were uh, a threat and were therefore liable to be unlawfully surveilled um their tactics included wiretapping and bugging american citizens without a warrant um opening citizens mail uh, planting informants and in targeted organizations and cable interference and um, I'm going to move a, a few uh, decades up to the uh, National Security Agency Massive Dragnet. Um, so the NSA was established in 1952 to conduct signals intelligence. Signals intelligence is the interception of any kind of signals um, transmitted via, you know, 
electronic means, telephones, telegrams, and eventually computers, cell phones, anything that's connected to the internet. Um, and the limitations were originally, you know, for the NSA were originally for foreign intelligence. Um, but, you know, it, it kind of got justified that if a terminal of communication exists within the United States, and that terminal happens to be communicating with another terminal that's outside of the United States, then that um, terminal that is even within the United States can be considered some kind of foreign uh, target because it's merely communicating with someone outside of the United States. Um, so in 2015, um, contractor, NSA contractor Edward Snowden revealed the massive bulk collection of of data gained by various nefarious spying tools and programs that have been used to surveil the American citizenry. Um, and I'm just going to go through a list of some of these programs. PRISM, it uh, collects data directly from the servers of the world's biggest internet companies. So Facebook, Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, I mean, if you know the name there, it's probably have, giving data to PRISM. Um, and it collects the information directly from the servers. Um, and this includes email, chat, stored data, file transfers, any kind of uh, logins or notifications or activity on that platform, um, and uh, online social networking details as well. You have X Key Score, which collects, curates, and makes navigating the mass collection of data easy. Um, it also captures email, text. Google searches, browser history, and generally monitors a person's online activities. Um, it allows NSA analysts to search the system's database by email address, telephone number, and other identifying attributes, such as your IP address, internet protocol address. Um, and one of their most powerful tools is their corporate collaboration. Um, the NSA actually relies a lot on private companies and, and uh, financial institutions to provide with its uh, intelligence. Um, in fact, according to Tim Shark, 70% of the national intelligence budget is being spent on the private sector um, as of the uh, release and publication of those files um, in 2015. It may have changed since then. I don't have access to any of those files, so I don't know. <laughs> um, the, um, and it, you know, it outsources a lot of its functions to some of the very institutions and companies that it surveils and takes uh, information from, um, including Microsoft, Verizon, Intel, HP, Motorola, AT&T, um, Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, and even more concerning is that you have these companies kind of hire previous government officials and uh, defense officials and what have you, and then someone from their company will end up in a position of government power. Um, so it's like they're playing musical chairs in order to make sure that a flow of capital keeps going to their practices um, so they can help to continue to survey all the American citizenry. Um, there are little to no systemic uh, obstacles to these practices. Um, the very foreign intelligence surveillance court that's supposed to keep the NSA in check um, as of 2012, only rejected 11 of the 20,000 requests um, that it had received to surveil citizens. Um, and um, it has even gone so far as to prevent officials, and by officials, I mean elect people of elected positions, from being able to get basic information on the NSA. So now I'm going to move forward to Blue Leaks. Um, so blue leaks actually happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, 24 years worth of data from police intelligence centers were attained in a data breach um, and, and leaked by a, a self-proclaimed anonymous affiliate to the transparency activist distributed denial of secrets. They uh, host a website that has a, a vast collection of different uh, leaks files information on various institutions of power of various different types um and this was all released in response to police and governmental handling of the recent black lives matter mobilization and protests 
it these leaks revealed that law enforcement have been uh, monitoring social media posts and tracking financial transactions involving the recent protests against police brutality. And just to, you know, and reinforce the validity of the documents, the National Fusion Center Association, um, which these centers from which these files came were from fusion centers. And I will go into more a little more detail about fusion centers in a couple of slides here. Um, but the uh, United States National Fusion Center Association verified that these were legitimate um, files and that um, they were actually gained during a data breach from a web development and hosting firm, NetCentral, which is another private uh, company that aids in surveilling the United States citizen. Um, and the uh, denial, the, excuse me, the, dis, the distributed denial of secrets Twitter page is actually deactivated um, according to their uh, Twitter's terms of service of not allowing distributed or not allowing hacked material to be distributed on their platform. However, there have been some speculations that there's been more of a push for Twitter to remove them because of uh, some of the leaks detail a, uh, a, uh, an institution called Data Miner, which uh, is affiliated with Twitter, um, that uh, has strongly aided in uh, law enforcement's ability to surveil protesters. So there have been several instances of individuals facing the consequences of their social media actions and support of Black Lives matter movement um, according to these um, releases and according to some very well done reporting by the intercept ellie anderson a coopville and i really hope i'm pronouncing that correctly tennessee resident actually had us home visited by fbi agents after he organized a peaceful black lives matter protest his mother was forced to interact with the agents in his absence because he wasn't home um, and these agents claimed that they had been monitoring his social media activity and believed that he may have information about Antifa. And upon Ellie's arrival home, the agents already departed. Um, so he luckily didn't have to interact with them, but they still pursued him. Joel Fangold is one of many that have been in some cases arrested and questioned by NYPD on their views on anti-fascism and other political ideologies. Um, Joel Fangold was um, apprehended after he walked outside of his home, his apartment, when he heard some sort of, sort of ruckus between, and he realized that it was between police and um, and a neighbor, and um, it it so happened that uh, you know, he had made some social media posts as well, which led to you know this question. So now I'm going to go forward to tools and facts. So we know, and you know, I've discussed a little bit, how social media is being monitored. Okay, I mean, it, if you if you really think about it, that's not much of a surprise. Um, but that's not the only way that uh, authoritative figures and law enforcement can domestically surveil citizens with the help of private corporations. So. Earlier, I did bring up fusion centers, and what these centers do is they gather and analyze crimes, hazards, terrorism, um, et cetera, and they kind of distribute that information between other fusion centers across the United States, and they disseminate that information to other uh, law enforcement agencies and institutions. Um, this was actually kind of a blossoming uh, practice you know, in, in response to the 9-11 uh, and some of the permissions that the Patriot Act gave people of power. So one of the tools that give fusion centers information is our uh, international mobile subscriber identity catchers, also known as stingrays and cell site simulators. Um, if I were a Saturday morning cartoon villain, this would be my uh, my weapon of choice, um, simply because it just mimics a cellular tower and just siphons information from people's phones um, without knowing that that's going on. Um, and the, it's even more, I mean, it's it's humorously nefarious and that there's, there's not just one standard kind, there's several different types of these horrible, horrible, invasive 
devices. So you have the kingfish, um, which is a surveillance transceiver that just allows authorities to track and mine information from mobile phones over a targeted area. It covertly gathers unique identity codes and shows connections between phones and others being dialed. So not only does it kind of do an area of effect type of surveillance, it also, you know, gets information on who the recipients of everyone in the area that it's surveying may have. So it, 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 it's an intense device. The Amberjack is another of these type of stingrays, monitors the signal strength of the targeted phone in order to home in on the suspect's location in real time. Um, luckily, you know, for authoritative figures and people that monitor social media, they can probably just use, you know, your Facebook check-in or whatever to, you know, track your geolocation. But the Amberjack is also a really good uh, option. So you also have the harpoon, um, which amplifies the boost of devices such as the camera, and helps to project its signal further greater distances. Um, it's more of a support type of uh, tool. You have the gossamer, um, which can which can be used to secretly gather data on mobile phones operating in a target area. It sends out a covert signal that track tricks phones into handing over their unique codes. It can also be used to perform a denial of service attack on phone users, blocking targeted people from making or receiving calls. Um, yeah. There are also license plates readers, um, which are computer controlled systems that capture automobile data, such as license plate number, location data, et cetera. People that are in the car, and, and that's drivers and passengers. Um, and uh, Again, this information is, is held by police stations and fusion centers and whatnot. They're also held by the private companies that make these uh, license plates readers. And just to let you guys know, the, um, the Stingrays and the, uh, those devices I just described are created by the Harris Corporation, which is another private uh, corporation that helps to surveil the American citizenry. So there are also drones that are capable of real time and recorded location tracking. I mean, I'm sure we've all have seen drones at this point. Um, they can intercept phone networks and Wi-Fi networks, and they are also able to carry a variety of attachments, such as bean bags, tasers, and really whatever can fit on the drone. And there's really no, uh, I mean, drones can vary in several various sizes. It's as big as a drone is depends on what can be put on it. And last but not least, social media. Um, online posts and profiles are basically self-composed dockets of profiling and suspicion. Um, activities such as follows, likes, retweets, and etc. connect you to ideologies and other users. And um, you know, guilt by association is a thing to be concerned about these days. Um, and these connections and associations can be weaponized against you, as we've seen in these, uh, but in the instances of these people that have been harassed for their social media posts. So uh, I want to also take a look at some legislation that's kind of gone through that's kind of helped to intensify the surveillance state. So the first and foremost, probably most, the, the Hulk of them all is the Patriot Act. Um, was a response to the travesty of 9-11, um, really just shattered our country. Um, it expanded the abilities of, of law enforcement to surveil, um, and this included by tapping into domestic and international phones. It eased in interagency communication to allow federal agencies to more effectively use all available resources and counterterrorism efforts. This kind of helped to lay the way for the creation of the, those fusion centers that are being used um, in conjunction with private uh, corporations to surveil the American citizenry, and um, as well as increasing the penalties for terrorism, crime, and an, an expanded list of activities which would qualify someone to be charged with terrorism. There is also the Electronic Surveillance Modernization Act, which um, expand the definition of an agent of power to 
include a person who is reasonably expected to possess, control, transmit, or receive foreign intelligence while such person is in the U.S. So on that first bullet, I just kind of want to do a thought experiment. Earlier, we discussed how the uh, a person, a terminal communicating with another terminal, even if it's in the U.S., if it's communicating with a foreign terminal, then it is considered foreign intelligence. Um, it's excuse me, it's categorized as foreign intelligence um, by the FISA courts and by the NSA. So it's okay, it's permitted. Um, this being the case, let's think about how just the internet in itself works. It's literally a web of connections. Um, anyone under that logic, if you want to call it that, could be reasonably expected to possess, control, or transmit foreign inter foreign intelligence um, simply by the loose association categorization that are being allowed to fly. Um, this act also allows the general, gener attorney general excuse me, to uh, direct a person to secretly provide the government with uh, all information and facilities needed to acquire foreign intelligence information and allows the person to challenge the order in court, thank God, um, I guess. Um, but again, you know, foreign intelligence has been so loosely defined at this point that it's really just, it can be applied and is being applied to domestic intelligence. Um, this uh, Electronic Surveillance Modernization Act also allows the Attorney General to authorize emergency, elect emergency electronic surveillance if he or she determines that an emergency situation exists in which electronic surveillance is necessary, as long as he or she applies for a judicial order within 168 hours. I mean, honestly, they're going to take what they want anyway, so they'd probably waste more ink and time on that part of the bill than, than needed, but, you know, here we are. There are the FISA amendments. Act of 2007, um, which allowed the Attorney General to authorize the emergency employment of le electronic surveillance for up to 168 hours w without a judicial order. So that there we go. I guess you know they 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 realized the flaw of that previous bill and decided, okay, well you know we just might as well do things without judicial order. We're doing it anyway. Um, it prohibits information obtained from intelligence acquisition from electronic communication service providers from being used as evidence in any trial, hearing, or other proceedings in the United States if the court finds no probable cause, unless the attorney general deems the information a threat of death or bodily harm to a person. And again, I mean, it would be interesting to see how far one would go to make that claim, um, just simply to be able to use such evidence. Um, this bill also often, again, this passed and the previous bill passed as well. Um, this bill authorized, authorizes the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence to acquire foreign intelligence information from foreigners located outside the United States for a period of up to one year, including um, electronic communication including and requiring, excuse me, electronic communication service providers who immediately provide the government with information and assistance. So even, you know, even in the case that they wouldn't want to provide such information, um, private corporate in, uh, institutions are forced to, to comply with the uh, government on surveilling the United States citizenry. So there's the FISA Amendments Act reauthorization of 2012. Wow, I really repeated acts twice. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, and it authorizes the intelligence community to electronically target individuals who are reasonably believed to be located outside the United States in order to gain foreign intelligence information. Again, with the way that uh, the way that foreign intelligence is categorized, the 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 idea that something could reasonably be termed outside of the United States, despite the, despite the fact that it is in the United States, should, should be something to you know, consider. Um, this act also specifies that the foreign and that the intelligence community's compliance with federal laws will be supervised by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. 
which really doesn't hold the NSA to any kind of checks and balances, and authorizes the intelligence community to obtain relevant and pertinent information about certain individuals from an electronic communication service provider. Um, again, they're able to go to ISPs or any kind of internet-based company and grab information on the American citizen. And I just wanted to discuss a couple of uh, local uh, laws um, here in Texas in the Lone Star State. HB 352, it's off authored by Cesar Blanco, allows law enforcement to warrantlessly obtain any information collected from a cell site simulator device in case of a life-threatening situation if the device exists within the officer's territorial jurisdiction. Otherwise, an officer would need a warrant. Um, again, if um, we, we've seen in the past you know, couple of months here, officers claim that having a water bottle thrown at them was an excuse to use literal, um, to commit little, literal war crimes. So why couldn't they just find some way to determine something as a life-threatening situation in order to warrantlessly collect information from a device that was just beyond most people's knowledge, stealing information from their phone to begin with. Luckily, the bill was left in committee at the end of the uh, Texas 19, 2019 legislative session and is to, is to uh, be reviewed by the House Committee on a Criminal Jurisprudence. There's HB 353, which is also authored by Blanco, um, which uh, amends the Code of Penal Criminal Proce Procedure to allow search warrants for the search and seizure of electronic consumer data held in electronic storage. Um, this uh, uh, Electronic customer data can mean information revealing the identity of customers of the applicable service, information about a customer's use of the applicable service, information that identifies the recipient or destination of the wire or electronic communication sent to or by a customer, the content of a wire electronic communication sent to or by a customer, cell site information, which is the, um, the information that would be connect, connect, excuse me, collected from like a cell site simulator. Um, so that's a lot of geolocation data, um, things like that. And any data stored with the applicable service provider or on behalf of the customer. There is SB 78, which was authored by Senator Bob Hall. Um, it allows law enforcement and municipal parking authorities to use images and data produced from automatic license plate readers specifically for law enforcement purposes. Um, aside from the use of issue parking, violation citations, information collected from these readers could be employed against a motor vehicle involved in a criminal offense or ongoing criminal investigation a motor vehicle registered to a person involved in a criminal offense or ongoing criminal investigation. So uh, I also wanted to take a look at a few uh, court cases in the past few decades um, that kind of show what happens when technology is um, thrown into the courtroom and how its uses are interpreted and justified. So. Uh, to quote Cyrus Fabiar, um, the law, the law then is now often struggled to keep up with the common realities of the day. Um, he has a wonderful collection of these court cases in his uh, his book Habeas Data. I really strongly suggest it. Um, but, but the whole point of this of this book is to kind of show, you know, like I was saying earlier, how easy it is to abuse power and uh, talk around technology to just justify its uses to take advantage of the American people. So 1929 was the first case of a wiretapping in US history, and it was in the Olmstead versus the United States. And uh, that court case actually determined that the government had not violated Olmstead's Fourth Amendment rights because there was no physical trespass on his private property even though no warrant had been issued for the tap. Um, in 1942, you have Goldman versus the United States. Um, the defendants were eavesdropped upon by federal agents who rigged a listening operation, uh, excuse me, apparatus. There was not a ghost, there was a device, an apparatus in the partition wall between a room in which they converse and an adjoining office from which the agents listened. So you had a wall and you had listeners on one side of the wall with a device in the wall and then you had 
the uh, people that were being surveilled on the other, ignorantly being surveilled on the other side of the wall. And the uh, Supreme, Supreme Court ruled that this was no more of an interception of EOIR communication than someone simply overhearing the conversation from sitting in another room. The Supreme Court ruled that someone using a device to listen to people between walls was, is, is, I guess for lack of a better term, is innocent as someone just overhearing a conversation from sitting in another room. Um, and this is a wonderful quote from Supreme Court Justice um, Frank Murphy on Golden versus the United States. He wasn't too happy about the uh, outcomes there. The, uh, the condition of modern life has greatly expanded the range and character of those activities which require protection from intrusive action by government officials. If men and women were to, are to enjoy the full benefit, the full benefit of that privacy which the Fourth Amendment was intended to provide, it is our duty to see that this historic provision receives a construction sufficiently liberal and elastic to make it serve the needs and manners of each succeeding generation. That means we have to keep amending and updating this. Um, we can't keep letting our technology outgrow our legislation because if we do, then we will continue to, we will see situations such as Golden versus the United States. Um, so, and again, I'm going to move up a few decades here to 2009. Um, there was a jury brief on the case of the United States versus uh, Jones, excuse me, sorry. Um, and the Department of Justice actually argued that uh, even though a GPS tracking device was warrantlessly installed on a defendant's Jeep, Jeep, there was no violation using information collected from the device in court because the defendant knowingly exposed herself to the public when they decided to travel in that vehicle. So the argument was that because that person would have been exposing them that travel information anyway to the public simply by traveling, that there was nothing inherently wrong with, you know, using the information collected from a warrantlessly installed GPS uh, tracking device on their vehicle. Um, luckily, um, that didn't fly. Um, and the defendant kind of got, you know, a fair, a fair ruling on that deal there. But even though it didn't succeed, people are still people. Someone made that argument. A person of power made that argument. And people in power will continue to make arguments to justify the abuse of power and the and the um, willful ignorance of how technology works. So. Um, and I guess light of all that, there are defenses against, you know, the American citizenry being consistently surveilled by the, uh, by a corporate elite in conjunction with its own government. So Signal, wonderful uh, app and allows encrypted chat and communication and it's free and accessible. That's it on your phone. Um, it's encrypted. So even if you're communications are intercepted, you know, there it'll be they'll be scrambled. So it, it won't be easier to decipher, you know, what you're trying to tell someone if someone does happen to intercept your information with a cell with a cell site does simulator device or something like that. Um, we have Tor, which allows for a uh, secure web browsing. It's also free and open source. Um, it routes your traffic through several layers of servers before you reach your destination. So it makes any kind of interception a bit of a challenge. We have Tails, which is an open source operating system. Um, it operates in conjunction with Tor. Um, and after a shutdown, it erases traces of visited websites, stored passwords, or uh, any kind of devices or Wi-Fi networks you may have access. So everything just gets erased. It's really nice. Um, there's off the rec messaging, which is an encrypted chat messaging um, software, also open source. Has built on authentic authentication so that, you know, you know that the person that you're talking to on the other end is the person that you were intending to communicate with and not someone that may have intercepted your communications or what have you. 
and then lastly um just be cautious of social media activity um ask yourself you know is do i have to like this do i have to follow this in order to get this information um that's one thing to be aware of it but in order to to connect yourself to it intimately via a like or a follow etc um, as we've seen earlier in the talk here, can lead to harassment or uh, associations of uh, inconvenience, for lack of a better term. Um, and if you can avoid using social media to organize and uh, discuss, then I would do so, um, just because we've seen the results um, of what happens if you don't. And um, that is my last slide. <laughs> so, uh, would I gather that that would be the conclusion, David, or did you have some closing remarks? Um, my closing remarks would be that in order to kind of keep ourselves safe going forward, I think that it's important that we focus on, you know, building our own infrastructure and networks and whatnot for some sort of internet, because at this point, the internet in itself has been compromised. Um, it's it, there are all these programs and whatnot their NSA is using and then you have these companies that I mean honestly I I find it unethical that they comply with you know surveillance desires and whatnot but um also it's kind of they're they're being held at gunpoint you know because if they don't comply they're not going to be able to practice their trade so I I'm not one to typically give sympathy to a uh, corporations and whatnot, but I can in this I I can't help but to in this situation. Um and then um yeah that's uh that that's about it. Oh well very very great talk David touching on a lot of awesome uh informative subject matter there. Um I'm excited that uh we actually did have somebody take us up on our Twitter at so I am I have one question for you from Twitter before I hand it over to just people in general. Um, but I was asked on Twitter just what your thoughts in general are about the technique that a lot of these surveillance organizations use of parallel construction, uh, specifically where like they will use uh, evidence obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment as a springboard to build a legal case upon, and they will do this, and even though it's obvious they wouldn't have known to build the case without the ill-gotten evidence in the first place, they claim that they are not in violation of the exclusionary principle because, oh, well, we didn't present any of that evidence in court, even though we wouldn't have found the legal evidence without the illegal evidence. <laughs> So, um, so just to make sure I understood the question correctly, what was my opinion on that? I think just in general on how it relates to like the operations of the NSA and others. I mean, I don't know if you have specific thoughts. I just was more trying to explain to those who might not be familiar with what parallel construction is, what it is. Got you, got you. So I um, I think that these tools make that just really easier, really easy for someone that would want to do that. Because the thing is, there are just the things that I presented and discussed are the very few things that we know about. <laughs> so like I I can only imagine from what other sources information is being taken. And you know, if it could even be determined with our current legislation and, and, and governance regarding technology, if an unethical apprehension of information apprehension of information could be determined as an illegal. Um, apprehension of information. Mm. And I actually have a quick follow up for you from the same source. Um, specifically, um, do you have any information specifically about, you know, you talked a bit about, you know, the corporate cooperation with the government and the NSA on this sort of stuff. And, you know, you talked about, you know, essentially the rock and hard place that a lot of these companies like Twitter and Google find themselves in. Um, you know, the question specifically was wondering if you could maybe go on a little bit about, um, the mechanism by which they're often coerced to do this national security letters. So the the so the the mechanism meaning 
I guess, by by what law they have to. Is that? Oh, well, I I mean uh, to read the question I was asked literally. Um, just to talk about national security matters to let people know about the government power, about you know the power how the company can be gagged via this mechanism from even telling people that they are being coerced. Oh yeah, I know Yahoo and Twitter are a couple of the uh, many entities that have been kind of you know forced to. And um, the thing is, they're a lot of times aren't even allowed, like you said, they're gagged. They're not allowed to let their customers or users know that they had to provide whatever information they had to provide. Um, it's uh, again, not that I'm not saying that I'm trusting or justifying because there there are instances in which, you know, Google, Yahoo, etc., do willingly give information to the NSA. But again, there are some times when they just have information taken from their servers. Um, right. You know, there, there's times where, right, they, they've just been tapped by the NSA and they didn't even give permission. But then a, a good example of where they're – it's hard to say how they're not at fault would be something like the data miner example you gave where a startup Twitter has invested in is given direct access to Twitter's fire hose. Oh, and that startup, by the way, gives all of its data to law enforcement. <laughs> Yeah, I have a hard time defending Twitter on that one. <laughs> um, so, all right, that's the, the questions I have from Twitter. Do we have questions from anybody else? My general request to everybody is tentatively unmute your mic. If you discover you're talking over somebody, respectfully uh, you know, quiet down until one person at a time is talking. But do we have any questions for David? What is the status of the uh, Earned Act? Is it uh, still in the Senate? Is being uh, prepared to go to uh, full conference? Um, I do believe that that is actually still in the Senate, correct, Kevin? I believe it is. Um, let me try to get, as I said, I was more it, uh, just giving you all an announcement on it. There may have been an announcement in the last few days I'm not currently up on. Let me, um, if it, I will look that up real quick, and I'll chime back in with the answer. Um, if David knows anything I don't, you're also welcome to chime in. Um, but while I'm looking that up, uh, if anybody else has questions for David, have at it while I look into that real quick. Um, yeah, this is George. I was the one who asked those other questions. And one of the things about the national security letter, uh, letters that is particularly troublesome is not only are the the company or the individual with it who's presented the letter um, has a gag order to not tell his customers, he's not even, or that he or she is not even allowed to contact the company's attorneys. So they actually gag the ability to appeal or fight back on it. So if they go to a CEO and say, here's a national security letter, we want this data, that CEO isn't allowed to tell anyone anything except to execute that order talk to his you know cto or something but he can't go to the corporate attorney or any sort of legal. you know it basically prevents that individual from communicating to you know even within the company shareholders any of that to fight what the government is saying basically a complete edict that you can't fight so i just thought i'd mention that so people um would understand how uh just invasive those are Thank you so much. So it sounds like to me what happens is they just completely can revoke someone's rights to justice to yeah. the most literal sense possible. <laughs> yeah, in fact, there was a company one time that got one that was a basically a ISP that was extra secure and it was during the Snowden break and they wanted his uh, that company's um, are you thinking of Lava Bit? What's that? Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, Lava Bit email. Yeah, which I think was the encrypted provider that Snowden was using at the time. Uh, they gave him a gag order for his keys, and he shut down rather than handing. He just over. shut it down. Yeah. He 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 basically said, "I cannot, in good faith, give these keys, and not tell my customers." So he just shut his business down, which in effect communicated what the government didn't want to communicate, but he they couldn't prevent him from doing that. Um, by the way, just going to quickly chime in what everybody uh, know. Um, I dug in a little more to the current status of the Earn It Act. 
as far as I can tell on congress.gov, there's been no action on it since July 2nd, so about 12 days ago. As for where it was at that point, it is still before the Judiciary Committee, specifically, um, so the bill, the Earned Act, which was introduced by Senator Graham, um, had been introduced, it had been referred to the Judiciary Committee, and its current action bills, you know, I, I used to work in legal software for the state government, so I know a little bit about this, but bills, when they go through their life cycle and a legislative body, they get flagged with an action to represent where they are in the process. The action that the Earned Act is currently flagged with, and the Earned Act, by the way, is under S3398, for anybody who's interested in its official uh, introduced number. Um, but the current action on it in the committee on the judiciary is ordered to be reported with an amendment in the nature of a substitute favorably, which for those of you who are like, what the hell does that mean? It basically means that they are in process right now of taking the original bill and they are all collaboratively making edits and modifications to the original bill. They are working through that process right now. They have not yet reached the stage where they have finalized the text and are going to present it to the Senate at large to vote on. So um, it's still in the Judiciary Committee. It hasn't even left that. It is still totally something that you can contact your lawmakers and tell them is terrible and they should vote down. Um, uh, and, uh, and sorry, yes? Uh, what about the House? Uh, has it actually ever been in the House with its makeup? Um, it uh, there, it is. I, not I feel like it's been kicked back from the house because I remember the headlines a couple weeks ago, all over the place, said that it left the judiciary committee, and on Congress.gov, it said that it left the judiciary committee. So it must have got kicked back for that amendment you're talking about. Mm. Okay. Let me see Thank what you. its full. Let me see what its full action history is here. Just one second. All actions. Granted, I haven't checked Congress.gov in about a week, but I do remember seeing it. Um, uh, let's see. Its full history was it was introduced on March 5th, read twice, and referred to the Committee on the Judiciary. Child. March 11th, the initial hearings were held, and then on July 2nd, the action I saw was performed. I do know there was back and forth between the House and Senate specifically on – Trial. What, um, I know there was back and forth specifically on um, trial. Um, could somebody? What is there, Mike? Uh, having some, um, anyway, um, I can dig into more to anybody's interested. But as far as I know, it has not passed yet. It has not been read. It has not reached the full House or Senate yet, much less been in any kind of conference committee. But. Um, I'm finding nothing saying it's been passed yet by either the Senate or the House. So you absolutely still have time to kill this thing and tell your lawmaker uh, to vote it down. Because, um, yeah, basically, David was just telling us about Signal. This law will make Signal illegal. So you kind of want to kill this. <laughs> so you want to contact your rep and senator and talk to them about it. Thank you for your uh, answer, sir. No problem. If, if I can um, piggyback onto that, Kevin, yeah, um, yeah. Graham also introduced another bill recently. Um, where did I put my phone? Uh, <laughs> hold on one second, because I actually have the number written down as well. Okay. But um, the Earn It Act, I am a nerd, and I actually did read the whole thing, and it doesn't directly attack encryption, but it's kind of one of those hint, hint, wink, wink things. Oh, uh, it's much slyer than that. It's it's cleverer than past attempts. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but there, there's another one, S4051, and that one straight up attacks encryption. And fortunately, it's been introduced. I don't even know if it's been assigned to committee yet, but that's another one. Um, S4051, on. pulling it up. Hey, government yeah. accountability of pulling bills up on the internet is great, everybody. You should try Isn't it, it sometimes. It's so rad. Um, it's only yeah, been introduced. S4... It's not passed or anything. Sorry, I, look, I couldn't help myself. Yeah, um, yeah S4... neither of them are passed, but. Yeah, yeah, and S4051 is a bill to improve the ability of law enforcement agencies to access encrypted data and for other purposes. Well, with a title like that, you know it's going to be bullshit. And yep, Graham introduced this one too on June 23rd. Um, this one isn't even as far along as the other one. It's only been referred to the Judiciary Committee. 
So yeah, um, it was just introduced, but it's worth keeping an eye on. And it's this is one of those things too that you can't just bank on that. Oh well, bills take a long time to make it through the House and Senate, and that oh well, you know maybe the makeup of Congress will change uh, by in November and these bills won't pass. Well, as any of you who follow surveillance and Fourth Amendment issues a lot already know. While the Democrats are better on this topic than the Republicans, they're not great either for those of you who follow this for a long time. Like I can promise you if these make it to the floor, a senator like Dianne Feinstein will vote yes on them. So I don't care if your lawmaker is Republican or Democrat. You need to contact them and tell them that uh, these attacks on encryption are unacceptable. Do any of these bills uh, provide for a backdoor in encryption? Um, well, the, the Earned Act does, but in a sneaky way. Specifically, it proposes to create a sort of best practices committee with a bunch of different stakeholders about various best practices for how online security should be conducted, but not so coincidentally, this committee of stakeholders is stacked with law enforcement entities, as opposed to all the other people who have a stake in online security and encryption, that like something like seven out of the 12 organizations on the advisory committee are all in law enforcement, people like the NSA. And one of the proposed best practices claims that a security best practice will be to have encryption backdoors. It's almost a, it's a tautology of a bill, basically, where, oh, we're just passing a bill that promotes best practices. And by the way, we've stacked the deck to say best practices are what we want them to be. Because one of the things that hasn't been addressed with that is if you put a backdoor in encryption, it's broken. It's not effective encryption. And, you know, a thing like Snowden happened where there was a big leak. There is no assurance that whatever backdoor is there won't be leaked and then affect our banking and anything we re truly need to be secure outside of law enforcement. And that's oh, what it's no, that anybody who understands the technology absolutely understands that argument. I've made that argument when I spoke on this issue related to the encryption requests of law enforcement around the Sutherland Springs shooter here in Texas. I uh, went on the news and argued against their position and for and against encryption backdoors on the local news, uh, making very similar arguments to that. Um, people who know the issue already know that. I even got uh, recently, we managed to get into the Texas Democratic Party's official platform that they are officially against encryption backdoors. So um, if you find any Democratic politician in Texas who is for encryption backdoors, point them to their own party platform because it now says their party is supposed to be against that. So uh, that was a good victory on our part. But awesome. yeah, um, people like Lindsey Graham and Bill Barr, uh, they know it's not good. Uh, they don't care. Uh, William Barr, since he was the attorney general under George H.W. Bush, has for a long time hated any form of encryption and has pushed to violate the Fourth Amendment. Um, if, you all remember, if, you, if you all remember the uh, clipper chip saga of the early 90s, which was sort of the first round of the uh, yeah. crypto wars, uh, Bill Barr was actually one of the major figures pushing for that. So he's been at this for a really long time. I mean, the argument would certainly be made that putting our Financial records at risk is a security. Can't secure our financial. Oh, I, I agree. That absolutely. And, and believe it or not, um, yeah, I mean, banks and big tech are often actually for encryption, precisely for that reason, because they understand its importance. Well, that's the thing: is they don't want to ban encryption, quote unquote. They want to ban end-to-end -end encryption. Well, right. They they want it encrypted most of the time, but they want it to be that when it gets to the exit node, that the payload is automatically decrypted so they can look at it, basically. A backdoor for the good guys, because those mm -hmm. exist. Yes, absolutely. Never, mi ne never mind that it's not even a matter of, oh, I'm 
some principled idealist who doesn't live in the real world. Like it literally doesn't exist. You you know they prove this mathematically. You can't build these encryption backdoors. They're actually impossible with the laws of math and physics in the universe we live in. But I don't know if we're dealing with people who fully get that sometimes. Well, the thing they could get is that leaks happen. Any politician knows that leaks happen. And, you know, Snowden proved that. And if there is, you know, some key to that back door or some piece of information, it will get out. Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, believe it or not, um, you know, it was very interesting that I remember quite a while back, one of the big proponents of essentially drone surveillance was, uh, once again, uh, Diane Feinstein. But she suddenly decided she was very much against drone surveillance as soon as an activist flew a drone outside the window of her mansion in California. So, yeah, I think these people often forget the very tools they want to create can be used against them. So we'll see. But, yeah, it's, you know, just shining a spotlight on the Earned Act because – uh, it's very easy to forget about such things, given that um, those of us who are still employed and not sick are very thankful and really trying to keep it that way. And most of us don't have much bandwidth for much else these days. But well, that's, that's, that's exactly what people like Senator Graham are counting on, that we're all too just trying to stay alive and distracted and that he, we won't notice what he's doing. There's also this thing where logic isn't a thing that makes that works anymore. Like it's sort of like pre 2010 or 50, well, let's say 16, that logic in an argument isn't of value. <laughs> Not to well, be cynical, we, but we here at EFF Austin still like to believe it is. Certain <laughs> people make me sometimes doubt that, but we're gonna still keep the faith on that. Oh well, yeah. Um, I mean, what else can you do? Are there uh, are there any people we haven't heard from yet who would have a question for uh, David? I want to make sure we hear from everyone who wants to speak. Um, and by the way, if uh, hello, hello, I can hear you. Uh, whoever that was. Trial. Uh, is this Thomas speaking? Trial. Um. I keep hearing a weird robotic voice whenever you're trying to talk. Um, I'd love to hear your question, but I'm not quite sure what you're trying to ask. <laughs> trial? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just keep hearing the word trial over and over again. Um, maybe you can figure out whatever that tech problem is. Uh, does anybody else have a question for David? Hi, this is Hossam, uh, um, and thank you. Um, uh, David for this presentation. Thank you everyone for the question. So th there have been reports uh, from uh, friends and friends of friends uh, of uh, people traveling to the United States in the airports and then they would get their social media accounts uh, uh, checked uh, and used uh, to ask or to investigate them while uh, in, in any way or form um, and they would be coming on either like for, I mean, this was before the COVID-19 days, of course, uh, either for visit or if they would come for if they uh, are on a work visa or any other form uh, of uh, entrance um, uh, visa to the United States. Do you know, have any idea about this and about the, first of all, uh, the legality of it? Uh, uh, do they have the authority to do so? And, and how would they do it? I mean, in many cases, I heard that they, they would do that before even asking for these, uh, uh, their, their, their identities on social media. So I actually did see a couple of um, articles on this. Um, I haven't done a deep, deep dive into them, um, but unfortunately it, it, it is 100% legal for them to be able to look at people's social media information um, because it's technically, so it really depends on the platform. If it's public information and so far as their account setting is that anyone that's not in their accepted network is able to look at their posts and whatnot, that's, that's 
free range. I mean, that's that's basically like writing your name on a piece of paper and writing all of your thoughts, signing it, and then just just letting it go on the wind for whoever to catch it catches. Um, and then yeah, you have this. De definitely, what David says. You know, make your social media posts not accessible to the internet. Make them private because, yeah, you're. You know, we have flimsy enough legal protection when they are private. But actually, yeah, a court's probably going to say you had no expectation of privacy if the posts were public. So that would probably be step one. Sorry to butt in there, David. Yeah, let me let you continue. No, no thank you. Um. Yeah, Kevin's right. And then even when, you know, if you do have some sort of private communication posts or whatever, I mean, we have those, you know, visa gag orders that I believe George was so kind enough to go into a little detail about that would one way or another ultimately end up in either them getting the information that they wanted or you not being allowed in the country. And so just, yeah. And sorry. And I guess just to springboard a little more on a, a few things on the topic, I do know. I know that this is not specifically related to uh, uh, entering the country, but this is, you know, as David said, you know, law enforcement surveils social media a lot. We, like we at EFF Austin have been talking about that for the last five, six years at this point. We knew it was going on on Facebook and other platforms even back then. Um, but um, I mean, there's been even disturbing reports recently about around the recent protests that NYPD, like in New York, has been wanting to search protesters' social media for proof that they're Antifa members. So, um, yeah, this this wanting to weaponize people's private thoughts on the internet by law enforcement, it's a very disturbing trend. And the truth, unfortunately, as well, at least as far as you know, entering, you know, crossing the border and entering the country. Um, uh, certainly under the Trump administration, we're going to see them taking a very hardline stance about the quote unquote sort of people they may want to let into the country. But when you're crossing borders on international flights, you're running into some incentives where regardless of what the law is of what is legal or illegal about whether they do or don't have a right to search your devices um um and in and and I, if you do look into eff they've talked about this some and unfortunately your legal rights are actually very hazy there have not been enough things that have made it to the supreme court or enough laws passed to really clarify what your you know uh first and fourth amendment rights are as far as things like social media entering the country um, what I can tell you, though, is that you're – to give a personal example, I remember about a year ago I went on an international flight to Paris, um, and I remember at the time, um, you know, I was getting – you know, I was in the U.S., and I was going to get on my Air France flight, and they um, – essentially, this was my first time encountering at an airport that they wanted to verify my identity with facial recognition, and, and obviously I was um, – very uncomfortable with this, obviously. I didn't want to end up in a uh, facial recognition system. Um, and and the truth is EFF says that, you know, you often probably if you protested, you probably could insist on other forms of identification since there's been no law passed saying that has to be the identification. But I, you know, I basically asked the Air France representative, like, can I identify myself with any other means? Isn't my passport sufficient? And what I was basically told was the following, which is, well, you know, you can claim any right, and I'm paraphrasing, but they basically said you can claim any right, you can say you want to identify yourself any means you want, but the practical facts of the matter are you will let us identify you with this facial recognition system or you're missing this flight. I wasn't going to miss my flight, so I submitted to the system. And that's the kind of impossible place when it comes to crossing borders that you'll often find yourself in. Maybe you sue them after the fact. But the fact of the matter is, is there's an immense power differential in that situation, and they have you at your mercy in that situation. Yeah. Th th oh. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Dave. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have some other questions for David? Earl, did you have I'm a question? A... I saw you had your mic unmuted for a second. Oh, Nick there? You have a question, Nick? Um, I'm just curious, and... Uh... I don't know. I, I guess this is just I'm curious what David's thoughts are. Um, 
do you think, because you've mentioned the relationship between uh, government and corporations quite a bit, and absolutely there are many, many cases of government strong-arming corporations with gag orders and things like that. We just talked about Lava Bit earlier. But also, um, I've also seen other people argue that corporations kind of pave the way for this sort of surveillance that, uh, for example, Facebook makes a, a, an ecosystem where everybody is so eager to share every single intimate detail about themselves. And the CIA never put, figuratively or literally, as far as we know, put a gun to Zuckerberg's head and said, you know, we want to collect all this information. They just went, hey, sweet, and jumped on board. So what do you think is, I, I guess, just what are your opinions on how much government is pushing the surveillance versus how much like corporations are pushing it even without the government forcing them to like what are your thoughts on? i would say that i think it's honestly you know equal fault on both things really um because you have these 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 corporations these people designing these tools applications etc that i mean if you think about it uh, in this in the the grand scheme of human history are pretty powerful and amazing tools. You can, everyone in the world could be a part of the same conversation at the same time via the power of the hashtag. That's amazing. That's unprecedented in human history. However, there was, it seems as though there, there may have been some kind of very convenient concession to ignoring the implications and impossible consequences of the tools that they created and have marketed and propagated. And I think that, you know, they're to be held responsible for that, for a lot, for, I guess, to make, put it simply, refusal to concede to ethics. But I also can't help but feel that there is a bit of a fault on the, on the citizens as well. Um, in so far as that we, very easily allow things to exist because they're convenient for us. Um, so I think that there is a lot of fault on corporations and government and law enforcement entities. But I also think that it's important to recognize that we as citizens have to say what kind of practices we're okay with being with existing in our communities. Do you think to follow up on that? And I, I agree 100% for the record. Um, but do you think that maybe somewhere in there, there needs to be, I, I don't even want to say transparency, a, a greater level of understanding? Because, uh, for example, when the whole Cambridge Analytica thing came to light in 2016, I remember telling my sister about it and saying, Hey, do you know Facebook is reading your messages, your text messages? And she went, oh, yeah, my face. I specifically said text messages. I remember that. And she goes, oh, yeah, my Facebook messages, of course. They're Facebook. It's Facebook Messenger. And I'm like, no, your, your text messages. You have an Android phone. They're reading your text messages. And she was like, oh, no, I, I didn't know that. And so obviously some of it is hidden, and we don't know until things like Cambridge Analytica come out. But do you think there's also more responsibility somewhere on the line for people to be more aware of what they're handing over. Cause I feel like a lot of people aren't making that educated decision where they say, yeah, I'm cool handing this over because I'm getting this free product in return. But a lot of people don't really understand how much they're handing over. I feel like. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I believe that, you know, and I believe that in order to make sure that people can make those kinds of decisions and, and ethically and logically, you know, decide to give that data and whatnot, that's going to be that's that's going to be a subject that I think would have to be a core component of systemic education. You know, at a young age, it needs to be instilled into future generations' minds, understanding and whatnot that this is what data is. This is what data is capable of. These are the types of people that use this kind of data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then for you know everyone else, you know. Of, of the current generations going forward, it's it's going to take a decision of self self education, and um, I I think that it's imperative that we do that unless we want to continue to be jerked around by people with power. Just a and one I, last thought on that. It's more yeah. of a thought experiment than an actual question, but that makes me wonder. 
back in the 60s, hitchhiking was totally normal. And then all of a sudden people realized it was dangerous and stopped, or maybe it became dangerous. I don't know, but it just, it makes me wonder what that shift would have to be for, uh, to get to the point where, you know, nowadays hitchhiking is dangerous. Don't get in cars with strangers, things like that. But I, I wonder what it would have to take for data to reach that point where ubiquitously, we all agree, like, don't give your data to everybody. That's just, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, I don't know what that would look like. I can't even begin to imagine because just the human brain is just so absurd to begin with. To, to just kind of imagine what would take us to that point is, 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 I think there are variables and factors that would be heavily dependent on just very, very niche and specific era based situations <laughs> where you are, who you are what time it is, the what direction the wind's blowing, you know? And um, I guess just um, to give a little interesting follow-up to your question, Nick, um, this is, uh, you know, sort of speaking of like potentially active collaboration on corporations' parts as far as surveillance of uh, um, with relation to intelligence agencies. This is one of those places where I'm not going to dabble in some of uh, the more unsubstantiated conspiracy theory sides of it, but I can tell you a little bit about what is publicly known, and you can draw your own inferences. Um, for those who've been around in hacker digital delivery communities long enough, you've probably encountered the uh, internet urban legend rumor at some point, the idea that uh, Google was created by the CIA or NSA, that it's like a front for them and a project they created. There's no substantial evidence that that is true, at least nothing out in public. Anybody who's claiming that's proved is engaging in a conspiracy theory. However, there is some interesting information that is public knowledge, make of it what you will, uh, which is that back in the 1990s, the NSA and other intelligence agencies were responsible for giving a large number of grants and seed funds to computer science departments all over the United States. Specifically with, if you look at the reasons they gave out the grants, it was basically to spur the creation of a Google-like tool. Not Google, but a tool that would let one search the internet. Uh, the burgeoning internet at the time. And um, Stanford was one of the recipients of one of these grants, and specifically Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who were grad students at the time, were the recipients of one of these grants. And they even had an intelligence agency, quote unquote, handler, who was their liaison, who they would report to, to give reports uh, to answer to the people who'd given them their grants and grant money. So while there's no evidence that intelligence agencies created Google and it's a front for them, it is absolutely a matter of public record that they were early funders of Larry and Sergey's grad student work uh, back when it was Backpage before it was Google. This is a fact, by the way, Larry and Sergey will vehemently deny if you bring up to them. They really don't like people mentioning this early part of their history. So, you know, there's some interesting connections between these big tech zaibatsus and intelligence agencies that I don't know if there's public evidence of active collaboration, but there's some interesting ties that I think more is going to come out over the years. All right, now that I gave that anecdote long enough, do we have any other questions for David? People we haven't heard from yet. I will call out by name people I actually know and embarrass them, but um, if Earl or John have questions for David or would just like to say hi, uh, be interested in hearing your thoughts. Sure, it was a great presentation. Thank you, I appreciate it. So the, the white supremacist group, uh, Boogaloo Boys, were these techniques employed to, uh, to get these guys arrested or surveilled? Thanks. Files that were leaked movement um, a couple years ago, they are um, listed as targets of surveillance. Um, I mean, it's not, I can't justify murder once and then not allow it universally. So I'm not going to say that it's a good or bad thing, but I will say that they are also 
um, subjects of, uh, of time. Hey, hey, David, by the way, I think when you're moving away from your mic, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you could give a quick summary of what you just said, because we only caught about 50 percent of it. Yeah. So in the uh, in the files that were leaked in the Blue Leaks situation a couple weeks ago, they were um, listed as targets that are being um, listed as targets by law enforcement um, via social media monitoring, monitoring and other tools. Um, so yes, they they are being targeted, um, as well as many many other groups, many other people. Yep, awesome. Uh, and yeah, I see John is unmuted. Uh, good to see you, John. Uh, I owe you some emails about the EFF Austin uh, mailing list website, so you may expect a ping from me about that. But just thought I'd say hi and see maybe if you had a question. Well, no questions. Uh, definitely, David, thank you for putting this together. I wanted to mention, uh, just because a lot of folks don't know, but even uh, Keyhole, Project Keyhole, Google Maps, I mean, that was something that was actually funded by DARPA and a lot of intelligence work, and then Google turned it into a public project. So uh, historically, there's a lot of esoteric connection, even MongoDB. I mean, how much did InQtel donate to Mongo to get that off the ground, you know, 75 million. So there's there's a lot of overlap where the the correlations you were making earlier come into play. But at, at the end of the day, whether or not it's malicious or to outright just spy on everybody or whether or not it just fit a specific need and that's why it got funding is, I guess, where the question goes. Uh, outside of that, I mean, I would, I would also point out that Historically, and this isn't necessarily recent, but through some of the investigation that came from the Texans from or Texans for Accountable Government work, it was actually pointed out that TAG, Texas Normal, and even EFF Austin at certain points have been under surveillance just for the sake of of keeping tabs by certain law enforcement groups. So, oh, uh, really, uh, really, John, do you do you perchance have a good link where I could research when and for what we ended up under surveillance for? I mean, obviously, I know you get involved with a group like this, you end up on the NSA's list of a couple million citizens worthy of heightened scrutiny. But I'm curious if you had links to the specific records where they were surveilling us and for what. <laughs> well, I, I believe this actually came up even as long ago when Gregory was in the mix and running some of these meetings. But um, I'll see if I can't dig in to the original tag reports where some of this was surfaced, but it actually came from the fusion centers. And it was work that was off the cuff with APD. And it wasn't necessarily that there was any known bad actors within the groups. It was just groups notably worth observing just and and I'll, I'll definitely do my homework and try to figure out where some of those references were but it's it's I, no foreign topic yeah i i know greg was really pushing like a decade ago that operation war drive stuff and the reporting on it so i imagine it was probably something related to that but i at the memory as is, I'm just curious. I'm wondering if maybe there have been any more recent things we've been advocating for that they flagged us again. I just figure it's uh, good to know one's adversary. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I guess uh, during the next legislative session, I mean, who knows how this is going to play out? And it's my understanding that it's a redistricting session as well. So uh, who knows oh, what will actually materialize <laughs> in terms of bills moving forward on many fronts. But the, the reality is the more noise you make, uh, regardless of the effort, the more prone you are to being surveilled. And and I guess that really goes to the heart of what David was saying from the get-go that that led to this discussion. So, um, I mean, those who are active will be surveilled. And at the end of the day, hopefully the history is written to reflect the will and the intent of the people and not just how it was perceived or manipulated. So um, I'll do my homework and I'll try to get some resources to you for certain. I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I guess just based on one thing you said there, John, and, you know, David's talk as well, I, I guess just one thing I think I'll say that I think I speak for the entire board at EFF Austin. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, David pointed out that it seemed the only criterion for which you would get subjected to unlawful surveillance in violation of the Fourth Amendment is that you had an opinion outside the mainstream. Did more often, frankly, an opinion on the left wing outside the mainstream because law enforcement not to stereotype is often somewhat right-wing in opinion, but um, in general, it seemed 
sufficient opinions that they viewed as sufficiently far outside the mainstream, they decided were worthy of breaking the law to surveil, whether or not these groups actually represented any violent threat of any kind. Um, and I think one thing that, you know, one of the things we at EF have often tried to advocate for in general is that, you know, it, we often will, you know, encounter with law enforcement, you know, these scenarios where they'll be like, why are you guys pushing for this stuff? Because you got nothing to hide, you got nothing to fear, you know, that, that old lovely chestnut. And a lot of it is about in, in a free society, you have to make it where there's not tools that can be weaponized by any one party to oppress other parties like like this like we often find you know like that i i often like to say that when you build a, a weapon and in this case it could be a surveillance weapon there's no way to ensure that it will be used responsibly or the way its creators intended so a lot of it is about just ensuring that that you know that we all you know it's to make it so that we don't give an uncontrollable weapon to somebody who can weaponize it to oppress all of our rights regardless of our particular opinions and this can be a hard thing to communicate to people because you know most people think that there are certain groups in society that that are dangerous for whatever reason um you know the, the people on the left tend to think certain groups on the right are dangerous and vice versa and and most people are kind of willing that they think somebody's sufficiently dangerous to let anything go and, and beat them by any means necessary. But as I said, if you build a super weapon to defeat those people, there, there's nothing to prevent the weapon being turned around. Like I remember back when the Snowden leaks first happened and uh, a lot of Democrats tried to defend – Obama for, you know, expanding the program. I mean, he didn't start the program, but he took the program he was handed by George W. Bush and massively expanded. And a lot of Democrats tried to defend him basically by saying, well, he's a responsible guy. He's a constitutional law scholar. He's not going to abuse these powers. He's going to use it for good. And yet the very system he built is now being weaponized by the Trump administration in even more egregious ways. Like, it, even if you have philosopher kings in charge, it doesn't mean they're always going to be in charge. So that that's a lot of why we really advocate for a lot of the positions that we do. Um, yeah. Um, so we're starting to run a bit short on time here. Um, do we have any final questions or things we want to hear from people before maybe I find we spare David uh, the spotlight and we can all get on with our evenings? Anybody else? Speak now forever, hold your peace. Cool. All right, I'm going to let us all out a little early. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate your support. We uh, know these are crazy trying times, so the fact that so many of you have continued to come month after month to attend these uh, really means a lot. We're, we're glad that you guys continue to support us and believe in what we do. Um, I'll do a quick little plug right now and say that we always can use your donations. If you go to our website, EFFAustin.org, there's a PayPal link on the page there at the top that you can click on if you'd like to throw a little cash our way. Though, if you're short of funds, I will always say you should give the, that money to EFF themselves instead of us if you don't have money for both because they're the ones actually funding the lawyers and making the, the real changes happen. Um, We'll all keep you in the loop and about actions that need to be taken. You know, I didn't even touch on other things that are of concern, like, um, you know, one big topic in the news right now is contact tracing and contract tracing apps, which contact tracing is, on the one hand, vitally important to control this epidemic, but if done poorly, it can be a massive privacy violation. Um, and frankly, most proposals I've seen have not navigated these two competing concerns very well. And I'm in the weird position of both being a former bioengineer and a digital celebrities activist, so I feel I can talk a little better about this than most people can. Um, but these issues are going to keep coming up, um, and I know we're all doing the best we can these days, but we're all going to need to try to stay on top of it. Um, you know, make sure uh, 
I hope uh, everybody here uh, figured out a way to vote by mail or safely in person in the runoff today. And I uh, trust you'll all uh, be voting in the general because it's going to be very important. Um, if there's anything that comes up that you want EFF Austin to focus on right now, feel free to shoot us an email at info at EFFAustin.org or at my email, kevin.welch at EFFAustin.org. And we're happy to try to do what we can to help you and uh, follow up. As I said, um, I'm trying to get together another tech policy panel with some uh, local candidates running for office. So stay tuned for that if you're wanting to get an idea of where some local candidates stand on some of these issues. Um, you know, because we believe in a diversity of tactics. You got to stay informed with the legislation. You got to try to get better politicians elected. And, and you know, I'll, I'll frankly say, if you're passionate about these issues, you know, um, probably too late in most cases in this cycle. But seriously, if you're passionate about these issues, I seriously encourage you to run for office because, you know, it in our community, a lot of us are libertarians and anarchists, so we tend to be a bit cynical about legislative change. I know I certainly am, but as I said, diversity of tactics, and the truth is that people sitting on that little committee or board you've never heard of um, often make decisions that very much impact your life. Um, so. You feel strong about these issues and you get furious that the Lindsey Grahams and Dianne Feinsteins of the world keep voting for this stuff. Well, you know, if, if we get enough people to believe this stuff's important, they only have as much power as we give them. So I'm going to get off my soapbox and let you all go. But um, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, we're going to all keep trying to serve you as best we can in these trying times. Everybody stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Later, everyone.